Amen, and he is coming soon. Amen. Uh, I uh, want to just uh, say how grateful we are to see you today. Uh, with the combination of time change and spring break, uh, I have to be honest, I anticipated a little dip in attendance, but we were pleasantly surprised by the faithfulness of our folks. Uh, Sunday school numbers are moving in the right direction, folks coming back and participating, and we are getting uh, close, close again uh, in our Sunday school attendance to what we were prior to when the bottom fell out of the world. And so we praise God for that, and we praise God that you're here, especially if you're a guest with us today. We want to tell you thank you, and all of our people together would just say welcome, and uh, just bear with us. Uh, we hope we don't scare you off or anything, but we, we, this is a very loving group of people, and uh, we are so glad that you're here this morning. Open your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, we're going to look there and we're going to look at a few other related passages. And if you are joining us for the first time today or recently just began joining us, we are in the middle of a series of messages called, What Is It? Uh, looking at just some church stuff that we do in church, that we've, most of us that have grown up going to church, we have done these things all our lives, and we are uh, looking at all the things that we as a body feel led to do together on a Sunday morning, trying to find the biblical foundation for it, the difference that it makes to our lives, and how it helps us as a body of believers to achieve the mission that Jesus has called us to. We've looked at some things like membership, uh, our small group discipleship that we call Sunday school here. Uh, last week we looked at worship and uh, what a blessing it was uh, to get to be there. And today we're going to talk about, and I'm going to be honest with you this morning, it is a sensitive subject and I know that it is. But if you follow the order of events that we do as a body of believers, we we gather, we go to Sunday school, we come and we worship, and typically in the order of events that we do, there is some time where we give an offering. And so today we're going to talk about stewardship, and I know that it is a sensitive subject, uh, and, but you know what I have learned over the years, the best way to talk about a sensitive subject is to start with a laugh, and so I want to tell you a story that was first told to me by one of, my, one of our deacons here in the church a few months ago, and I filed this one away. He told me that there was a Baptist preacher that stumbled across a magic genie. And of course, this is a joke, okay? So we, we know that we don't get into that stuff, okay? But he stumbled across a magic genie, a, a lamp out in the desert. And he picked it up and he said, there's no way that this could be it. But he, he went ahead and he, he, he rubbed it and out comes this genie. And the genie told him, well, you've, now you've got three wishes. You know how this thing works. And well, this Baptist preacher, he... He always had a desire to go to see Israel. And so he asked to see the, the promised land. And he said, I can make that happen. And he said, well, Jeannie, I, there's this one thing about this. I'm, a, I'm terribly afraid of flying. So you're going to have to build me a bridge to go over there. And the genie said, man, you're asking for an awful lot. Can't you, don't you have anything else? And he said, well, can, it, can you at least make all my deacons tithe? And he said, how many, how many lanes do you want on that bridge? <laughs> well, stewardship. It's a, it's, a, it's a sensitive subject, okay? But it's a serious subject. And here's a conviction that we have as a body of believers. We believe that every word in God's word comes from him, and it is for us. And that on a, even as a, a sensitive subject like this, that God knows that we need to know his take on these things to live the kind of blessing that he wants to give to our life. And so we're just going to look at a few principles today. I can't unpack everything that the Bible says in one message on our stewardship, but I want to leave you with a few principles to guide us today uh, here from God's word. But before we get started, I would ask, uh, especially uh, on this day, that you would join me in a word of prayer as we begin. So would you join me? Father in heaven, we come to you today, and God, we ask, Lord, that you would be with us, help us as we unpack your word together today. 
Lord, help us to see your truth. Lord, if your word says it, Lord, to be committed to it. Lord, open our hearts to receive the truth of your word, uh, even as it may make us uncomfortable, or Lord, as you challenge us to grow uh, in faithfulness to this. But Lord, most of all, as we, as we consider this message, we, we want to be mindful that, Lord, you modeled giving for us when you gave your son Jesus. And so, God, we ask today, most of all, out of everything that would be said, that, Lord, you would fix our hearts on that. And if any would be gathered in this place today, either physically or online, that, Lord, you would help them to see that their greatest need is to trust in Christ today before they leave. And, Lord, help them to do so. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. If you're there in uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, uh, Jesus begins by telling us, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, that is, he will choose to give his time, his devotion to one, or he will choose to give his time, his energy, his thoughts, his, the pursuit of his life totally to the other, or perhaps to neglect the other, or he will be devoted to the other and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The first reason, when we, when we look for a biblical foundation for our stewardship, and stewardship is so much more than just finances or anything like that, yeah, I want you to understand that this morning. But Jesus talks to us about our stewardship, starting here with this foundation of our financial stewardship, because he knows that uh, our finances are oftentimes the vehicle we use to find prosperity in, in life, to find peace, to find hope, that oftentimes that uh, our financial prosperity can be whether we have it or not, or to the level that we have it or not, that it can be a counterfeit gospel of peace that if we have enough zeros in our bank account, if we have enough in the IRA, if, uh, if we have enough stuff in this world, that then we find that we can substitute that for the peace that God wants to give. And so Jesus tells us that no one can serve both God and money, but we must make a choice about what will be the pursuit of our life. The old, uh, older translations, such as the King James, they translate this phrase, you cannot serve both God and money, as you cannot serve both God and mammon. And that was the old world way of talking about all material blessing, that you cannot pursue both God, totally and completely pursue God at the same time as pursuing for peace and for hope uh, and, and for assurance material blessing, that we have to make a choice about what is the one thing that we're going to pursue. Jesus' point here in this passage as we think about the first principle here that we see in God's word is that our posture of, being, of giving and stewarding our lives towards God is that when we pursue God and him alone, that it anchors our devotion in him, that he's going to have all of our heart, every area of our heart, and partly one of the ways that we do that, it's not the only way, but one of the ways that we do that is through our financial stewardship. Jesus' point here is that we have to make a choice about what we are going to serve. Is God going to be the source of our security and the pursuit of our life to pursue Him and to trust His provision to give us peace and security and hope? Or is our life going to be marked by a pursuit of material security? Are we going to find peace knowing that our Heavenly Father is our provider? Or are we going to try to create our own sense of peace through having enough stuff or enough material gain. And here's the thing, a lot of people, and I think that we at different points, we could all be open and honest at different times, we have all fallen into this trap of pursuing as much of the world that, as we can only to find out when, it, when it's too late how empty the things of this world can leave you when you pursue them. In fact, there was one rich gentleman, he, he was knowing that he was, 
coming close to the end of his life and he was worried about what he was going to do with the, pros- the material prosperity that he had gained and all, all of the things of that nature. And so he left a, a note of instructions in a vault that when, he was, when his time came and he was going to die that they were to take these two gold bars that he had and they were to put them in a bag and handcuff the bag to his wrist and that he was to be buried with them because he wanted to do everything that he could to take what he had earned in this world with him. When he showed up at the gate, Peter met him there, and he asked him, what's in that bag that you've got? And he pulled out two gold bars, and he was awfully proud. And Peter said, well, isn't that nice? You've brought pavement. (laughs) Because you know that in heaven that the streets are paved with gold. Here's what God wants us to understand. As important and as much of a blessing as it is to have financial prosperity. Listen, I'm a Baptist preacher. I know what it means to to do without sometimes. As much of a blessing as it is to have those things, listen, it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is our relationship with God and knowing that He will provide for us. But here's the problem. Until we rest our hearts and come to the place where God's promises to provide for us are sufficient for our peace, then no matter how much material things we have, it will never be enough to bring us the peace that we desire. We will always find ourselves wanting a few more zeros in our bank account, a few more, a bigger, nicer, better home, more, better uh, material things, cars, you name it, a better paying job. And praise God if he gives that to you. But if God isn't enough, no matter how faithful God is to pour out his blessing and to take care of us, we will never be satisfied in it, and it will rob us of the blessing of contentment of God's provision. And that's why the book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Listen, a great depression can wipe out everything you've ever earned, but God will never leave his people. And he will always be faithful to take care of us. I was, I was praying and looking over this, and I was reminded about the Israelites in the desert. For 40 years, God was faithful to provide for them. He provided sandals for them that didn't wear out for 40 years. Now, if Nike could do that today, they would have a copyright, a patent on it. But for 40 years, God, they walked in God's blessing. God made water come out of rock. God fed them quail when they wanted that. But every morning when they woke up, You can find this in Exodus chapter 16. Every morning that they woke up, God provided manna from heaven. It was as if heaven's bakery was open for business. And he poured out his blessing every day. It was not a question about whether God was blessing them or not. God poured out his blessing. And God gave specific instructions for them that each Family was to send out early in the morning and to gather an omer for each person uh, just enough to meet their need for that day. But he told them, don't store up extra. I want you to trust me every day. And I want your trust to be in me and not in the stuff that I give. But you know the story. The Israelites, many of them would gather up more putting their trust in the thing that God had blessed them with instead of putting their trust in God. And God wouldn't bless it. And it would rot, and it would grow worms, and it would stink. God added his blessing so that when they went out on the sixth day in preparation for a day of rest, that they could give twice as much to store up for that day because they were living inside of God's parameters, what he had decreed in his word for their life. And he would, where it would rot the other days of the week, when they honored his word and they did it his way on the Sabbath, then he would add to his blessing and it wouldn't rot and it wouldn't stink then. 
But when they stored up and they put their hope in material things instead of in God, their life stank. And here's the deal. God was faithful to provide and yet they weren't satisfied. And a lot of us find ourselves in life in different stages of life wondering why no matter how much we have, life stinks. Could it be that we are living our lives outside of God's design, putting our hope in things instead of putting our hope in him that sits on the throne? God was faithful to provide. And what God wants us to do, instead of being like these Israelites that put our hope in stuff, we've got to instead trust that our Savior has us. Listen, if he can pay the price that he paid to pay our sin debt in the extravagant gift of his son's blood, you can have peace in knowing the provision of our Heavenly Father and that God is enough. And when we honor God, he will add his blessing to us. And not just monetarily. Listen, his grace isn't that cheap. He will give peace. And he will make a way when there appears to be no way. And you can trust him to provide. When we make him the prize of our lives and the pursuit of our lives and put all of our trust in him and in him alone. And so one reason why we give is because it anchors our devotion to God. But I invite you to turn in your Bible with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. And I want you to see that, ultim- that, that really our giving ought to be motivated by an attitude of delight. By an attitude of delight. Look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 in verse 7. And the Bible tells us each one must give as he has decided, decided in his heart, not reluctantly. Or under compulsion. For God loves, listen to this, God loves a cheerful giver. God doesn't want us to give under compulsion. He doesn't want us to feel like we're simply doing, performing a duty. He wants us to know the delight of opening up every aspect of our life, even this one, and honoring him. And watching him pour out his blessing in our heart, his peace, his, his contentment that we will never find in the things of the world, but only in our relationship with him. A pastor once received, once had a, a fellow in the church come to him and ask if he could write a letter to the congregation. And the pastor was kind of hesitant, and he said, Pastor, I, I really want to send this letter to the body. I'm just concerned about the things, some things, and would you mind if I used the letterhead from the church to send out this letter? Well, the pastor, he was kind of nervous, but trusting this relationship, he, he allowed him to send out this letter, and he didn't know what it was in, but when he got one back, he had an idea about what it was. The letter came back, and it said, Pastor, I know I haven't been as faithful as I should have been, and I'll be there Sunday, and I'm even enclosing a check. But P.S., would you please tell the secretary, there's only one T in dirty, and there's no C in skunk. <laughs> Listen, God doesn't want us to gripe in our giving. He wants, he is pleased when we give from our heart. That's why the Bible tells us here that God loves a cheerful giver. And in fact, the word the Greek word underneath our English word that is translated cheerful, it actually uh, is the Greek word hilarion. You might hear it in another word, hilarious. That God wants us to come to such a place that when we give, that we, it just tickles us, knowing what God can do and how he can bless and how he can move beyond anything that we could accomplish on our, on our own or individually. But when he adds his blessing, when we honor him to see what he can do. And as we practice a lifestyle of gospel generosity, here's the thing. The, the, the thing that ought to bless our heart and motivate our heart is knowing, look, I'm, I'm not doing this just as a mechanic. I'm not doing this just because I have to. I'm not doing this because I've got a guilt trip. I'm doing this because of what God has done for me. And I want him to do that in the lives of other people. And when I give, I get to join God on mission to watch him change 
people's lives. Some ways that we see that happen in our body is when you sponsor a student to go to camp, amen? When you support a mission trip, when part of your offering goes to support ministries abroad, missionaries abroad like what we're doing with Annie Armstrong so that they can stay in the field instead of having to go fundraise and they can continue on mission. And here's the thing, when you get the giggles about giving, it changes the way you live. I believe that the gentleman I'm going to tell you about has probably gone on and passed on with the Lord. I, I don't know, and I'm certainly not trying to make him the emphasis here, but what God did in his heart in, in one pastorate that I was at. I was, in, I was in one pastorate, and we had this van that we called the Gray Ghost. We never knew when it was going to give up the ghost, okay? We, had the, uh, we would get in there and... Sometimes uh, the ball joint went out one time while we were out there picking up some kids in the van. And uh, I got to pray and I said, God, we can't keep doing this. This is kind of embarrassing being broke down on the side of the road. I didn't tell anybody except the Lord. One, one, one day while I'm in the office, here comes this fella named Fred. Pulled into the lot. And he was just beaming. Just beaming. When I got in the van with him and he wanted to take me for a spin, he said, uh, Pastor, I, I just want us to reach children. And he said, this is the end of it for me. Uh, man, I got to tell you, as a new pastor, I was a, as nervous as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs. I thought I had done something that had made him upset and that he, that he was giving this as his way out the door. But what he told me was, I don't want a soul in this church or in our community knowing what I did. Because God did it. And I just want to see kids reached. And man, when the kids would get off the bus on Sundays or Wednesdays, man, to see Fred smile and the, the way that his heart was delighted seeing what God had done. Now, I shared with you, I'm a Baptist preacher. I'll probably never be able to give an amount like that. But what I, that's not what I want you to hear today. It's not what God wants you to hear today either. It is not about the amount that you give. It is the attitude with which you give that God blesses. And whilst we may not be positioned to be able to give in an amount like that, all of us can give with an attitude like that that wants to see God be moved and to see God move. I know it's not the amount, but it's the attitude because Jesus in Mark chapter 12, he was positioned watching the offerings of the people as they came in on that Sabbath there. And he watched, as the Bible tells us, he watched and he saw some give large amounts. But he wasn't impressed with that. There was a lady at the back that brought up her, her widow's mite. You're familiar with the story. An amount that doesn't amount to much. Much at all by the world's reckoning. And she tossed in her two coins. And then Jesus had a Sunday school lesson with his disciples. And he said, I wanted to tell you, he pointed her out to his disciples. I want to tell you that that lady right there outgave all those fellas that gave out of their wealth because she gave from an attitude of dependence and out of her brokenness and out of her humility and out of her desperation and out of her need for me. Friend, it's not the amount. It's the attitude that God would have, have us to, uh, to live in stewardship with the heart of David when the people gave to the offerings for the building of the temple that he wouldn't even get to see. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 14, David prayed, Who are we that we should be able to offer so generously? For all we have comes from you, and we can only give what comes from you. All we have comes from him, and it is just an attitude that says, God, I want to see you move, and I want to see you change people's lives the way that you've changed me. And God, if it's surrendering this part of my life too, then God, so be it, because I just want to see you move and change people's lives. Here's the last thing that I want to share with you. Out of everything else that we've talked about this morning, if you don't hear anything else, Please hear this. The ultimate reason why we give and why we open up in stewardship is because of a gospel awareness of what Christ has done. 
We give because God gave when he gave Jesus. Look over and flip back just a little bit there to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. And the Bible tells us, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Some would look at a verse like this and they would see this as a proof text for some funny business uh, out there in culture called the prosperity gospel. They taught me a word for this in seminary, baloney. What he is reminding us of is that Christ being rich in righteousness, never having done anything wrong, out of love for us, chose to leave heaven, to leave his throne. And uh, while we were separated in our sin, in our brokenness, and we could never do anything to buy our way back to him through our own goodness, through our works, through, through trying to be a better person, by trying harder, we couldn't get back to him. But in his love, he left heaven and he died on a cross that we should have died on. Listen, I've told our church before, God could have given all the oil in Texas. He could have given the earth. He could have given anything else, but when God wanted to show his love, he gave the blood of his son for us. The greatest gift that could ever be given. And we give because God gave. He gave his son to redeem us and to restore while we were separated to bring us back into right relationship with God. You know, oftentimes as we think of just about a couple of practical landing places giving out of the fact that God has give, given. Oftentimes I get asked the question, is giving even biblical? And if, if it is, then how much should I give? Here's the New Testament believer's answer. God gave it all when he gave his son. And in response, all that I have is his. There are a couple of practical guides that the Bible gives us in response to tithing. Uh, the Bible tells us that it is the foundation to our giving. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10 even tells us God gives us his permission to test him in this. Listen, normally speaking, it's not a good idea to put God to the test. But God tells us in this, test me in this and see if you bring forth the whole tithe into my house that I won't pour out my blessing so much that there will no, be no more need. You won't have any lack. Listen, that doesn't mean you're going to get a brand new Cadillac. Amen. But he will meet your every need in Christ. In fact, Paul in Philippians in the close of his letter, he God gives us a promise that says, and my God will meet your every need according to the riches of Christ Jesus. Listen, God will be faithful if we step out in faith and trust. Some folks look at that and they would say, well, that was just under the law. Well, let me tell you that the, that the practice of giving the first 10% and honoring God as a picture of the rest of our life being in his hand, it comes out of Abraham's sacrifice when he gave the first 10% to Melchizedek, a, a priest in the Old Testament. And if you know your biblical timeline, Abraham comes before Moses and the law. That Abraham was uniquely situated like you and I, looking forward to Christ, not under the law. And I just got to tell you, I don't want somebody living under the Old Testament to outgive me. Amen? But, but as foundational as tithing may be, as New Testament believers, we understand that our giving isn't limited to just our tithing. Our giving is done in freedom, knowing that we can't outgive God. And we are free to give more as we are blessed. But most importantly today, I want you to hear this. The giving of our offering points, of our offerings, is only one part of our stewardship. It is only one part of our stewardship. 
So many people would hear a message like this today and they would fixate, man, that preacher, all he wants is my money. No. God wants our whole life. Our whole life. As we think about our giving, if we're being honest, those of us who have been in church and practiced this, sometimes our offerings that are meant to be kind of a starting point in representing the whole rest of our life being surrendered, sometimes the practice of giving can grow mechanical. It can be another mo motion that we go through, and we can think that we give and we're off the hook, but friends, that's not it. God wants our whole life. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible tells us, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, in view of God's grace, the way that he forgives sin, no matter what you've done, that you can find grace and redemption in him and what he did when he gave his son Jesus in view of his mercy, that he doesn't hold sin against us, that he, when he looks at us, he sees us just like he sees Jesus, not only as if we've never done anything wrong, but because of our faith in Jesus, he looks at us as if we've always done everything right in view of his mercies. Present yourself, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Listen, God wants our whole life. He doesn't want just our allowances. He wants our availability. He wants us to surrender our God-given spiritual gifts and abilities for service to him. He, here's what he wants. He wants a sold-out attitude. It says, I am all yours, Jesus, because you gave all of you for a sinner like me. There was once a little boy in Sunday school, and they had had a lesson similar to this today. And when time came for them to pass the offering plates, he reached in his pocket and he said, man, I don't have anything to give. But he knew God wanted him to give something. So as one of, the, one of the ushers went by, he grabbed the plate and he walked up to the front and he stood up on the stage and he laid the offering plate down. And he stepped into it. He said, here I am in all my brokenness and all my wrong. I want to give you all of me because you gave Jesus for me, friend, is that you today? Don't get lost in all the other conversation. The most important thing you need to do, whether you have been a believer for some time, maybe God's speaking to you today, maybe even right now, maybe as we have a moment of prayer here in just a moment, maybe there's some area of your life that God says, listen, I don't care about what you're putting in the offering plate. I want that area of your life totally surrendered to me today. Is that you, believer? Maybe you're here today and God is speaking to you about for the first time giving your heart and faith and in trust to God in response to his gift of grace that he's given us in Jesus. Listen, Jesus lived a life we couldn't live and he died as a payment for our wrongs. And he's risen to show us that that payment's all we're ever going to need. Friend, if you've never trusted in him, what the way God wants you to respond today is to say, God, I know I've broken your rules. I'm a sinner. I believe what Jesus did was for me. God, please save me. And if that's you, he will save you right where you are. And the next step that he wants you to take this morning I'm going to be down here at the front. For the comfort of everybody, I'm going to wear my mask. If you feel the need to come forward, you come forward and you make that decision public today. But our altars will be open if you feel the need to come. Would you stand with me and pray as our instrumentalists come?